Overwhelmingly, our research on the past year in the COVID-19 pandemic has suggested for commercial and residential real estate, the patterns that we saw pre-pandemic and the supply demand dynamics that we saw pre-pandemic, they're largely holding true. And so our confidence in the market, residential and commercial, is really sustained. That was Eric Willett, Director of Research and Thought Leadership for the Pacific Southwest Division of CBRE, the largest commercial real estate company in the world. Eric's joining me today to discuss recent demographic shifts and their impact on the commercial real estate landscape. Welcome to Capital Considerations, the market and economic podcast that's fully invested in your success. I'm your host, Tony Roth, Chief Investment Officer at Wilmington Trust. COVID certainly touched every aspect of our society. Not only did it result in remote work becoming ubiquitous, it intensified the need for more living space in homes that now often double as offices. We saw a greater desire for separateness that stemmed from social distancing on top of existing generational trends that were already leading for many different reasons, millennials and baby boomers, to what we might think of as second tier cities and the Sun Belt. All of this has contributed to massive population movements away from traditional urban centers. These changes all make it a good time for us to take a fresh look at the real estate sector and break down what's behind the migration and what might this mean for portfolios. We're fortunate to have Eric Willett with us today to talk demographics and real estate. Eric is the Director of Research and Thought Leadership for the Pacific Southwest Division of Commercial Real Estate at global leader Caldwell Banker Richard Ellis, often known as CBRE. He leads the development of forward-looking insights across property sectors that help to explain the region's evolving commercial real estate landscape and inform CBRE's client investment solutions. He's also a regular contributor to regional and national media outlets, such as the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and Fox Business. Eric was previously a vice president at RCL Co. Real Estate Advisors, where he led research and strategic consulting engagements for high net worth investors and families. Eric, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Eric, we've seen these big population shifts over the last year, and we've all experienced the work from home or the remote work or the hybrid work, and there just does seem to be this feeling that people want to get away from wherever they used to live. There are some distinct trends. People moving to warmer places, more more comfortable places, less expensive places, um, prettier places. When you look at it from your perspective, how do you see the the forces that are really driving these shifts? How permanent do you think they are? So as you know, I mean, the last year has really been a shockwave to the global economy, the national economy, and then also just to people's lives. And so as a result of that, we've seen some pretty dramatic and interesting changes in migration patterns. Now, the tricky part, of course, is that demographic patterns are inherently really sticky. Um, where people move tends to you know, move in these long waves. And so even pre-pandemic, we saw a, you know, a lot of the dynamics that you mentioned, people leaving urban areas, people moving to the Sun Belt, people leaving high cost areas in particular to lower cost metros. And across all three of those categories, we saw those same patterns continue in the pandemic and even accelerate, right? Um, that the this unique impact of the spread of the disease and the social distancing restrictions in place in various metros meant that people were reconsidering where they wanted to live and how they wanted to live their life. So what do you think the biggest winners and losers are from a geographic standpoint? I mean, we all hear about Austin, Texas. It's not just Elon Musk. He's only one family. <laughs> but um, And then on the other hand, San Francisco, I mean, my gosh, when I was growing up and uh, when I came out of college, everyone wanted to live in San Francisco. Um, and then the next generation, of course, it was Seattle. But these West Coast cities are really taking it on the chin as well. So when you put it together, where do you think the biggest winners and losers are going to be from the yeah, well, migration pattern? Well, let's start with the, the obvious ones. And you, and you hit on a lot of those key stories, right? And that the high cost coastal metros saw over the last year saw the greatest outflow. And I should, you know, going backwards a bit, a lot of our data is from U.S. Postal Service address changes, which is a really frequently updated data, very granular. And so it allows us to get some visibility into where people are moving in this unique period of time. And what it shows is that in places like San Francisco, Los Angeles, where I'm based, or New York, people left in much larger numbers last year than they were in previous years. In, in, in 
say 2019 or 2018, and there was already a net outflow. We know this, and this has been going on for a long time. But what was different about 2020 is the magnitude of that outflow. Now, the tricky part for those same metros is that most of that movement was actually close by. So San Francisco suffered the most from the COVID pandemic in terms of the outflow of, of talent and the outflow of individuals. But at the same time, the market that actually had the highest positive impact of the pandemic was Sacramento. Right. You know, just a couple, you know, 100, 100 or so miles down the road. And I think that really highlights this relationship between these core coastal metros and their surrounding areas. And that many people during the pandemic were reconsidering whether they wanted to live in their one bedroom apartment with their, you know, with their dog and, and their work from home setup and, and wanted some place with more space or more affordable and, and moved out of the metro. But they wanted to stay within what we call the economic watershed or the larger macro metro areas. That's fascinating because that's, I had not appreciated that. I had thought that everybody wanted to get out of Dodge. If you lived in the Northeast city and you wanted to move to Texas or Florida or Arizona. And so in a way that's somewhat reassuring for those local communities or States that not everyone is fleeing quite as far. And, and so what's driving that again, Eric, is that I love that term, the economic watershed, if you will, what's driving that is the desire to live in a place that's maybe a little bit softer, kinder, gentler, perhaps than that core urban center, but still being close enough to a work environment where maybe you could commute once in a while, or um, you're still near some of your family and friends. Absolutely. That, that's exactly right. And, and San Francisco and Sacramento, the relationship, the duality between those two is the most dramatic, but we see it across the U.S., Los Angeles to the Inland Empire, Riverside and San Bernardino counties, Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. Really similar dynamics where, you know, Washington, D.C., significant loser of people, Baltimore, significant gainer. Inland Empire, significant gainer, L.A., significant loser. And it reflects the fact that for the overwhelming majority of people to begin with, they like moving nearby, right? 80 plus percent of moves in any given year are within destinations within 500 miles of the um, of, of the origin location. And so that um, that reflects the, the, the link to families, the link to the economic opportunities, right. all of those components. And, and generally speaking, that hasn't radically changed then over the last year. People are still moving, but they're moving closer by. Well, we did see we did see an increase in people leaving their county and moving to nearby counties. Right. That number increased, but it's still, you know, that 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 reflects this dynamic that we're describing now. So that, that's the big loser side, but I want to get back to, to who the big winners are because you highlight um, the bell of the ball, Austin, Texas, for instance. Right. Um, yes. And certainly, without a doubt, Austin was a, a beneficiary of the pandemic. Many people you know, relocated to Austin. Um, and you can pick other um, up-and-coming cities, whether it's Nashville, you know, Boise, Idaho, take your pick. Um, but many of those cities were winning pre-pandemic. They saw an even greater influx of talent and individuals during the pandemic. Well, one of the theses that I had coming into the conversation was that a lot of this migration was driven by, by taxes with the repeal of the SALT deduction. Um, effective repeal of the SALT deduction, a lot of folks just couldn't bear the the burden of paying taxes at 13, 15, 16% total rates and decided that, hey, if I can go and live somewhere and pay 0% state tax, yeah, my federal rate will actually, effective rate goes up a little bit, but my total amount that I'm paying is clearly lower. It's just simple math, right? Is there a term for folks that are, are tax migrants? I would think that while it's a, it's a, it's a pretty clear and interesting story, probably aren't that many people that make enough money that are that motivated by taxes to, to really relocate. Right. That, that's exactly right. And the reality is the tax sensitive bucket of migrants um, is relatively small. And it's important to probably understand and, and highlight the dichotomy between cost of living and taxes, particularly in a state like California, where I'm based and do mo most of my research, in that for the overwhelming majority of the population in California, the tax code is actually quite favorable. So taxes for middle income earners in California are more favorable. The tax burden is lower in California than it is in Texas, for instance, which is not, you know, most people would assume that is not the case. But how could that be if Texas has no state income tax whatsoever and California does. 
It's the combination of taxes on retail, sales tax, um, other other levies. Oh, it's the all taxes, real estate system. taxes, exactly. the whole the whole picture. Got the it. The whole tax burden on on income earners, right? And so the it's it's this really kind of surprising um, element, and it reflects the progressive nature of California politics, right? That that are geared towards taxing higher income individuals and and oriented away from taxing lower income individuals. But all of that is to say. Taxes are low in California. Cost of living is obscenely high, right? And so there is a dynamic, and the cost dynamic for decades and continuing during the pandemic has been pushing more low-income and middle-income individuals out of the state because, simply put, the the cost of housing, in particular, is is um, exorbitantly expensive. Right, and that's a supply-demand phenomenon because people want to live in California because it's a nice place to live, all else being equal. That's right. The, the state has underbuilt housing um, for, for decades and um, is slowly building its way out. And, and it also reflects the, um, the attraction, the economic attraction of, and productivity growth in California and places like New York and, and Seattle and other really high cost coastal metros. These are the centers of the next generation of the U.S. economy, particularly tech, media and entertainment, um, legal services. And these centers are in high demand by well compensated workers and it is driving the cost of housing and the cost of living more generally up for the full swath of residents. So Eric, let's get to your specialty. Not I mean your demographics yes, but let's get to the actual housing. So we all know that there's been a something of a bubble in housing prices, whether it's vacation homes, whether it's primary residences for folks that are moving to Austin or Florida or or other areas, whether it's the exurbs so called or the suburbs it seems like everywhere you look, housing prices are at record highs pretty much everywhere. How much of that is driven by the desire for people that didn't own homes to now own homes versus just the housing stock, if you will? A lot of folks don't want to move. They don't want to give up their homes. There's not a lot of supply. If you have that many more people looking for homes and you don't have the normal stock coming on the market, even a small change in the margin sometimes can really radically affect a market. So what's really going on when you look at the dynamics uh, that are driving those prices so high? Absolutely. And it's a unique confluence of all of these factors that you mentioned and some more that are that is driving this um, really accelerated increase in housing prices. Before going there, though, let's say what we're not seeing, because I think the um, – it, it's important, particularly to benchmark against the last time we saw the B word used, you know, pre Great Recession. The, the B word being a uh, bubble, of course. But my um, my word, not yours. I know you don't like yeah. to use a bubble word, right? <laughs> right. Um, but the, what we haven't seen is reckless overbuilding, and we haven't seen reckless lending. Right. Those were two main factors leading up to you know. 05, leading up to the Great Financial Crisis and the Great Recession, and we haven't seen that play out over the last ten years. And we certainly haven't seen it play out over the last year. So I think that's an important grounding and that the dynamics that are underpinning this growth in the housing market are in, in housing prices and the increased demand are, are different, right? We're, we're, we're seeing a different set of factors. And what we are seeing is one, unprecedented interest rates, right? There, there's an unprecedented amount of money, of federal support, monetary policy support for the economy as a result of the pandemic that is creating, you know, amplifying demand for for um, for residential properties. And secondly, we had the pandemic, right, which changed for many people the way they relate to their living space because of this need to remote work or just a need to not be, able, you know, to cook, right? You can't go out to restaurants, whatever the case may be, the relationship to the house really changed. And so we saw for many people across the U.S. a change and a desire to change their living status. And um, that included a shift towards for sale um, properties. Now, one additional element that really ties into the demographic conversation we were having is that we're also on the cusp of a very significant demographic shift in the U.S., irrespective of the pandemic, in that the millennial cohort, which is an abnormally large cohort, we talk a lot about baby boomers, the millennial cohort is only slightly smaller. That cohort is now entering what has traditionally been family formation age and entering into the traditional age where they would buy first homes, right? You know, aging into their 30s, to, to put a number on it. And leading out of the Great Recession, the millennials we're not entering that, you know, home ownership in, in great numbers. But we think the pandemic, what we saw during the pandemic is this really sizable shift 
for this demographic in terms of the way they are living. And, and a big chunk of that is them deciding to actually purchase homes. And so that is enough of a shift that it changes the supply demand dynamics in a very real way. And also, I think the pandemic has had a very visceral impact on people emotionally, where there's a, a feeling that home is equivalent to safety. And if they didn't have a home, they didn't have a place to be sheltered and be protected from those forces in the world that have become really quite extraordinarily unpredictable and, and scary. And I think Absolutely. that a home represents safety. And, and and that in and of itself, probably for the millennials as, as well as others, has has brought them into that market. I, I think that's absolutely right. And on the flip side, that same sense of safety has had impacts on new supply listing, right? Uh, people willing to list their homes, right? If, if you are comfortable with your living arrangement and you have a nice home, why would you, you know, put it on the market? Prices aside, in, in the midst of this global pandemic and the concerns about, you know, safety and security and health. Um, and so I think there has been both this increased desire on the one hand and this reticence to, to list new supply. And so you're seeing that mismatch play out in the markets today. So as supply chains start to loosen everywhere, you know, lumber prices have come down. They've probably peaked um, other commodities, et cetera. And hopefully the labor market will heal itself such that people are not incented to sit on the sidelines or um, are not scared to work because they're going to become sick or ill or exposed to, to, to uh, the virus. There'll be some type of equilibrium that we'll reach um, in the housing market. Do you think that we'll be sitting in, in a year or two and we'll see a collapse in the housing market? And what about the areas that have been in high demand? Do you see any potential issues for people who just recently bought homes? Or do you think that this is more sustainable this time? It's more organic and the housing prices are going to remain high for quite some time. We think in the long term, this is sustainable. We, we see this growth long term and we don't foresee any sort of collapse. Now, there may be some pullback in the next year, right? We're in this really tricky reset period um, as we search for that equilibrium. And so, it's, you know, it is not unreasonable to expect some choppiness as we move towards equilibrium and get out of this really artificial um economic and you know health environment that we were in for the past year and a half. But we but we don't think that there is a fundamental mismatch in supply and demand that is going to lead to any sort of broad reset um, over the next several years. One of the most frequent questions that we're asked by our clients is, is it a good time to buy a residence? I'm not happy with my current residence. I want a larger residence. I want a second residence. I'm afraid to do it right now because the prices seem so lofty. And Certainly, if you're financing the residence and you're able to take advantage of those low interest rates, your advice would be to move forward and feel comfortable doing so, all else being equal, obviously. I would say overwhelmingly, and this is a bit of a bigger answer to that specific question, but overwhelmingly, our research on the, the past year and the COVID-19 pandemic has suggested for commercial and residential real estate, the patterns that we saw pre-pandemic and the supply-demand dynamics that we saw pre-pandemic while they've shifted a little bit during the pandemic, they're largely holding true, right? We haven't seen U-turns, we haven't seen about faces. And so our confidence in the market, residential and commercial, is really sustained um, and similar to where we were pre-pandemic. In some ways it's better, right? Like we, we think the, the economy is poised for really remarkable growth this year. That gives us a lot of optimism for sure. And in some ways it's worse as we work through the, the labor challenges of the last year. But overall, I think we, we we're looking at the, the real estate market broadly with a real sense of optimism and see really strong supply de demand um, dynamics for investors going forward. Let's just focus for a moment on that. So we, we did spend a fair amount of time focusing on the single family home, if you will, but thinking more from an investment standpoint, whether it's multifamily or whether it's warehouses or malls or office buildings, where do you see the greatest opportunity at? So first on the on the single family residential side, we've actually seen intense investor demand, usually on an institutional level, but also from a high net worth level in single family rental. Um, in particular, the growth of the build to rent single family rental market. It's somewhat of a new um, investment concept, only was institutionalized in the past decade um, since the Great Recession. But it's a really exciting space 
And we think the, the supply and demand dynamics for that sector in particular are really strong, similar to the single family for buy market, right, and for, for individuals buying their own homes. But for investors looking to invest, the single family rental market is really exciting right now. We've seen a lot of um, institutional capital come into the space over the last two years um, and a lot of exciting movement um, there as well. So there's, there's a lot to, to look forward to there. On the yeah. more traditional institutional asset classes, we continue to be intensely bullish on residential and industrial. For on the industrial side, the rise in e-commerce, um, the rise in consumerism and, and increased spending, particularly on goods and products as opposed to services over the last year, has been a real boom for that sector. Industrial pricing is at all-time highs um, and the market is intensely tight. And so that that is something that we foresee continuing going forward. On the residential side, it's really a remarkable story because if we had chatted six months ago, we would be looking at the numbers in major metro areas and saying it looks somewhat scary. And we've seen an intense drop. But just over the past few months, and I think this reflects that migration rebound as restaurants and bars reopen and offices reopen, people have been moving back to urban centers in, in large numbers. And the rent growth we are seeing in places like Los Angeles, where I am, or in places like New York, are really remarkable over the last several months, in, in many cases, creating records. And so the, the long-term outlook for multifamily residential is very strong. Um, and the economic pull of these major urban areas is consistent, right? So the, the investment prospects there are, are very positive. You mentioned office, and I think that's a really tricky place because there is this ongoing discovery period of figuring out how do large office occupiers want to use their space? What we increasingly see, though, is people are heading back to the office. I'm, I'm in the office today um, with, with, with a number of my colleagues, and, and we see this shift, and I think we'll see a lot more over the next several months as people move back to kind of a more, a new normal, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting, whether it be office or some of the other areas, for example, multifamily residential in, in the urban cities, even though the outlook for these areas may not be very compelling, doesn't mean they're not oversold and that there isn't good value to be had an opportunity. Right. And so as investors, if we build portfolios, we're always thinking in those terms, not just what's the most robust, but also where are values today relative to the opportunity. And that's right. something that is figures very importantly as we build portfolios. I want to ask you one more question, if yep. I could, which is taking a step back from the real estate space and just thinking again about the, those demographic trends, those currents moving through the country, when you think about the impact of how people are moving around different areas within more local communities or different areas of the country, what trends do you see that may be interesting for investors that are beyond real estate? In other words, do you see anything around the availability of workers in different areas of the country, um, different kinds of jobs, consumption habits, anything that would be observations that we as investors should be thinking about as we as we think of thematically what we put on our portfolios. Absolutely. So I think on, on the one hand, the pandemic really underscored the geographic sorting, if you will, of of different occupations. Right. And that there are certain occupations that are very mobile and certain occupations that aren't. And overwhelmingly high talent occupations are sorting into many of these winter metro areas. We talked about Austin. We talked about Seattle. These are really dynamic cities that continue to attract the most productive workers, the highest compensated worker, workers. And that has really strong benefits for those regional economies outside of commercial real estate. Right. Every aspect of the economy benefits from it. So I think that's a really interesting thread to pull on and a dynamic that we saw pre-pandemic for sure, but over the last year it has become even um, even more clear and more um, more obvious to, to you know the investment world and to people living in that world. On the other hand, I think you know one one dynamic that we have been following for many years in commercial real estate, but I think this applies more broadly is the rise of alternatives, right? And that as investors look for emerging asset classes or looking for asset classes with more yield, they're increasingly pushed to new sectors. And I mentioned earlier single family rental, um, which is one of those, um, what, what we would consider an alternative um, asset class in the real estate space. And I think that mm -hmm. investment shift and kind of that evolution of the investment world, and that's true at the institutional level, absolutely true at the high net worth level, it, it, it you know runs the gamut. But that shift towards alternatives is a really interesting evolution of 
the industry and the economy broadly that that's we're monitoring going forward. Really great insights, Eric. Let me summarize what I think are three key takeaways from our conversation today. First is that we've had an acceleration of something that was already in place, which is essentially the adoption by the millennials of the housing market. And we've had that happen in context of some really interesting demographic shifts and movements around the country, where we have these millennials really digging in, deciding where they want to live and that they want to live in homes. And I remember when they wanted to live in tiny homes or they didn't want to live in any homes. And now they want to live in real grown up homes. And that's really creating what I think is our second takeaway for today, a very healthy and sustainable housing market. People are comfortable with the idea of owning real estate. The interest rate environment, as you've, Eric, I think very importantly noted, is still historically accommodative by any measure. And so the idea that the housing market is in um, the kind of bubble that we had during the great financial crisis, where we had rampant speculation, overbuilt situation from a supply standpoint, and a level of consumption that was just based on, on, on leverage is not what we're looking at today. I think today we're looking at a much more fundamentally healthy environment. The housing market, single family housing market is, is very sound and very healthy. And then last is that these trends have created a lot of opportunity for investors that extend well beyond single family housing in the real estate space. We have the industrial space, industrial warehouses. We have multifamily residential in lots of areas of the country. And probably the other area that I would talk about is there are lots of areas of value in the real estate space, whether it be the office space or whether it be multifamily in the urban centers that you're, as you've talked about in Los Angeles, for example, and where we can acquire them with financing that is as cheap as, cheap as it is, they can be very attractive assets over a longer period of time. And so real estate is very dynamic, very multifaceted, um, and there's a lot of opportunity. And as we build portfolios, we're looking at the long-term potential of these assets. We're also looking at the entry price um, from a valuation standpoint, and we're finding some really interesting things as we put portfolios together. So I think those are three takeaways that I would um, ask people to keep in mind today from our conversation. Eric, I want to thank you again for being here today. Thank you, Johnny. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you to our listeners for joining us. And I encourage everyone to visit WilmingtonTrust.com for a roundup of our investment and planning ideas. You can subscribe to Capital Considerations on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast channel to ensure you get future episodes. Thank you all for listening today. This podcast is for information purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the sale of any financial product or service or recommendation or determination that any investment strategy is suitable for a specific investor. Investors should seek financial advice regarding the suitability of any investment strategy based on the investor's objectives, financial situation, and particular needs. The information on Wilmington Trust's capital considerations with Tony Roth has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but its accuracy and completeness are not guaranteed. The opinions, estimates, and projections constitute the judgment of Wilmington Trust as of the date of this podcast and are subject to change without notice. Wilmington Trust is not authorized to and does not provide legal or tax advice. Our advice and recommendations provided to you is illustrative only and subject to the opinions and advice of your own attorney, tax advisor, or other professional advisor. Diversification does not ensure a profit or guarantee against a loss. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. Past performance cannot guarantee future results. Investing involves a risk and you may incur a profit or a loss. Any reference to company names mentioned in the podcast should not be constructed as investment advice or investment recommendations of those companies. Facts and views presented in this report have not been reviewed by and may not reflect information known to professionals in other business areas of Wilmington Trust or m and Bank and may provide to seek to provide financial services to entities referred to in this report. m and Bank and Wilmington Trust have established information barriers between their various business groups. As a result, m and Bank and Wilmington Trust do not disclose certain client relationships or compensation received from such entities in their reports. Investment products are not insured by the FDIC or any other governmental agency, are not deposits of or other obligations of or guaranteed by Wilmington Trust, m and Bank, or any other bank or entity, 
and are subject to risk, including a possible loss of the principal amount invested. Wilmington Trust is a registered service mark used in connection with various fiduciary and non-fiduciary services offered by certain subsidiaries of M&T Bank Corporation, including, but not limited to, Manufacturers and Traders Trust Company, m and Bank, Wilmington Trust Company, WTC, operating in Delaware only, Wilmington Trust NA, WTNA, Wilmington Trust Investment Advisors, Inc., WTIA, Wilmington Funds Management Corporation, WFMC, and Wilmington Trust Investment Management, LLC, WTIM. Such services include trustee, custodial agency, investment management, and other services. International corporate and institutional services are offered through m Bank Corporation's international subsidiaries. Loans, credit cards, retail, and business deposits, and other business and personal banking services and products are offered by m and Bank, member FDIC. 2021 m Bank Corporation and its subsidiaries, all rights reserved. Private market investments are only available to investors that meet the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's definitions of qualified purchaser and accredited investor.